Hello, good evening, and welcome to Our Front. My name is Raymond Dalqua. Today, we will seek to get to the bottom of that particular controversy, which has been lingering for some time, but was restarted by the Minister for Trade and Industry. He's been given an update on the state of factories in the country and Commander Sugar Factory. It has always been mild in some level of controversy right from the start to this time. That controversy is not going away. The Minister of State, the Minister at the Trade and Industry Ministry, Alan Kojo Chemantin, insists all the evaluations that have happened up till now suggest that project was inflated. He also says, well, the exiting government, that's the NDC, had plans two months into the setup of the company to sell it off. We'll be getting to the bottom of this matter because I have the minister who superintended much of the work on Commander Sugar Factory. After the break, I'll introduce him. We commence our conversation and we seek to find out whether the claims by the current minister reflect the facts on the ground. You welcome back. This is Upfront. My name is Raymond Dakwa. Now, my guest today is a minister who served in the John Dramah Mahani Mahama administration. And to be clear, he's been a minister for a very long time. He was a minister during the Jerry Rollins time too and played various roles. My guest is the Honorable Dr. Ekospil Gabriel. Doc, you're welcome. Thank you very much. Now, the, the conversation is on the Commander Sugar Factory. We'll talk about other things maybe later on. But this factory became news this week once again, I mean just yesterday, when the minister during the press, uh, made the press encounter, made some specific accusations. Now, I need to take a listen to these accusations. We will come and subject the man who superintended the period to the necessary street proof. You're absolutely right. I do not just uh, issue um, <clears throat> a statement, an update, uh, to Parliament. Subsequently, I also, also put out a response to some of the media reports uh, coming out on Commander. And I want to wait for one thing to happen. Those who are talking, they will stop talking. You go and build a factory, $35 million. That, that's the valuation. Because it's very easy for us to understand. You borrow 35 million, so the valuation of the company, obviously, <laughs> which has to be close to 35 million. Now, even those who were bidding at the time that the previous government was trying to, and that's another thing we have to correct. I heard people saying that, oh, the NDC never attempted to, uh, you know, sell and offload it. They commissioned the factory in May. Within two months, they were already selling the factory. They had recruited a transaction advisor to offload 70% of their interest. And the evidence is clear. Those who were even bidding two months after that, go and look at the figures they were quoting. Go and look at the figures they were quoting to buy a new factory. <laughs> you know? And even the one who was supposed to have uh, won the bid, Later on, the man came and said, oh, the factory is not worth the amount that they And he thought that they were going to use that money to recapitalize the, the business and not to buy and pay for the, uh, the factory. Subsequently, all the, uh, the work that has been done, and the people who have expressed interest in Commander have said that that factory cannot cost 35 million. And remember, this is not about government doing the evaluation. There's a transaction advisor, an international company, Pricewaterhouse, that has been involved in this valuation. The valuation was $12 million. And it is consistent with the work that my deputy and the technical team, independent technical team, also did. You welcome back. So that's the crux of our conversation today. It's indeed what the current minister has been saying about this Commander Sugar Factory. That's always been controversial, actually, to still on record. Luckily, I have the man who is at the center of all of this here. You welcome once again, Doc. Thank you very much. I hope you're doing well. By God's grace, by God's grace. I saw you well. noting some of the things that he mentioned there. We yes. will take them one by one. Certainly. But first, 
why did we need a Commander Sugar factory revamped, resuscitated, rebuilt in whichever form as it is today? Why did we need it? Well, I think as you and many Ghanaians know, Ghana imports too many things. Recently, the CB was under pressure, and I think all the experts that came out, in addition to many other comments that were made, have acknowledged and admitted that the structural and fundamental challenge to strengthen the CB is if we can import less and export more so that we have a better balance of trade, better balance of payments, and people don't chase after a few dollars with a lot of CDs. And that puts pressure on the CD. So that's the big macro issue about our import-export situation. But fortunately, it's not every country in the world that can produce sugar. But Ghana is one of the countries in sub-Saharan Africa that can produce sugar. And the production of sugar is a factor of or sugar cane, for that matter. It's a factor of your soil conditions, your um, climate conditions, water availability, and so forth. And, and so during the Nkrumah era, in order to reduce our dependence on importation of sugar, the Kwame Nkrumah CPP government built two sugar factories. One at Aswichwari in the eastern region, the other one at the same commander in the central region. And based on information we have, sugar cane factories, if they are to be built near sugar producing areas, could easily be built in at least four or five other locations in Ghana, including in the Afram Plains okay. and including in the northern region, mm. uh, Savelugu, etc. But it all boils down to each invest, investment companies strategies and, and specific business plan. So in any case, um, I, let me give credit for the current sugarcane factory um, to my predecessors, because this is an idea that began before I became minister. There's a current sugarcane factory? Yeah, the Commander Sugarcane the okay. sugar, Commander sugar Factory okay. was initiated before I became minister. I see. So I, I can take the debit for any complaints, mm -hmm. but I want to give the credit to my two predecessor ministers. Hannah Tete was the minister at the time the discussions began with okay. the Indian government mm -hmm. on the Indians offering a loan. And it, the whole project, from my understanding, began based on the promise made by the then member of parliament for the Commander Edna area, KEA, um, Dr. J.S. Anna. At okay. the time, he was campaigning to be a member of parliament, that should he win his parliamentary seat and he has something to do to promote things for his area, he would promote the establishment of, or the re-establishment of the Commander Sugar Factory. Okay. By God's grace, he won his seat and became Deputy Minister of Trade and Industry. I see. A very good place for him to help to promote this agenda. So I'm giving credit to him, to um, Honorable Minister Hannah Tete, and then of course, subsequent to them, um, Honorable Minister um, Haruna Idrisu, who is now Minority Leader in Parliament. Now, Parliament, the Parliament of Ghana, has a lot to do with whether we have a sugar factory or not, because all the documentation, even prior to my becoming minister, went through Parliament. Why? Because if it was easy for private individuals to establish sugar cane processing plants in Ghana, five, seven, ten private Ghanaians would have established this already, mm -hmm. um, so just as they've established all kinds of manufacturing plants. Yeah. But they haven't. Because it is quite a, a challenging industry for any number of reasons. It's, it, was it the cost because, is a factor. Was it not because it was not a viable industry in the first place? No, that's, look, the, the Ministry of Trade, yeah. we can get to that. There have been more than five specific proposals by private sector companies. Nothing to do with the government. When I became minister, yeah. we went around promoting the idea of establishing additional sugarcane processing plants in Ghana, even mm -hmm. beyond Commander. Okay. And there were five fairly substantial proposals on the table from a British company, from a South African company, from a Mauritius company, and a Brazilian company, all of which were willing to invest in sugarcane processing plants in Ghana using their own money, nothing I, I, to the Ghana government. I just wanted to... So if it wasn't viable, viability is not a matter of um, the size of the factory. Yeah. I mean, there are many factors that go I, into that. I get that. you, but we will deal I with say, those I, ones. If your question is, is it viable to have a sugarcane processing plant in Ghana, if that is your basic question, the answer is absolutely yes. No, that That's was not, not my question. question. What's your question? My then? question was, as of the time that the state took on Commander Sugar Factory, were there significant private sector interest in the project? I wouldn't know. I can't speak to that. But I can say that at the time I became minister, 
and based on my own physical visits even to one of the largest sugar importing companies into Ghana at the time and maybe still one of the largest to their head office in London to tell them that look you've been, you've been importing sugar into Ghana all these years. Ghana imports about 300 million dollars worth of sugar every year. Why don't you become uh, a manufacturer or a processor of sugar cane? They took it up and actually began to discuss with us their proposal to invest in the sugarcane sector. I had the privilege of being part of a delegation of President Mahama to Mauritius. Mm -hmm. But even before I went to, to Mauritius, Mauritius investors had been to Ghana and looked at various places in the country where they could invest. That's why I mentioned Savalugu, for example. Yeah. That's why I mentioned the Afran Plains, because they have tested soils in, any part of, in this part of the country and have concluded that these soil conditions, first of all, sugarcane is being grown in, in, in Ghana anyway, whether I, I get your point. factory or not. Mm -hmm. Have you seen the women carrying the sugar cane? Yes, they sell it. They sell it. Even in traffic, actually. In traffic, there are yeah. circular versions, all kinds of interesting My cell. question so was... So sugar cane grows in Ghana. Yeah. Is it good to process that sugar and produce sugar sugar from it? That principle everybody that, agrees to. So what are we talking the, the, about? The, viability. The, the, the problem here was, mm -hmm. did we really properly investigate what happened to Commander Sugar Factory until it became the state that it was in until we sought to revive it? Oh, that's a, that's, at, that's at, a different at, question. At, at, that's at a different point. question. And I'm saying that almost all Kwame and Krumah's factories, which yeah. were all viable at a certain point, a factory can become non-viable for a number of reasons. Nothing to do with equipment, nothing to do with technology. It can be the human factor. So when you appoint, those were state-owned enterprises. I get so you. when we get to a discussion about why did we decide not to allow civil servants mm -hmm. to manage Commander Sugar Factory. And while we're looking we'll for make, foreign investors, we'll, we'll get that you'll point. get an answer to your question. That I, we don't want it. Ghanaian public servants or ministers like mm -hmm. myself trying to manage sugar factories, just like a certain government tried to manage Ghana Airways from the old Osu Castle and killed it. Now, let me be clear on this one. I wanted to know whether there was any work done on why the... Feasibility studies? Yes. Of course. On the studies. chroma time. So oh, what were the stated well, I mean, reasons? That's, that's, no, I'm not saying for the chroma I, time. I I'm saying that... that why Nkrumah's sugar factories failed. Yeah. That's both as and, and commander. commander. Many studies have been done on those by the State Enterprises Commission and by all kinds of other consultants way back in the 1970s and 80s. Mm -hmm. But that was not the basis of the term that because Nkrumah's factories failed, so every future factory will fail. I no, don't think that's I was only interested in whether I, or I not give you the there were learnings that. we could have actually had from this, I'm, I'm projected sure. into the future. Most of the learnings had to do with when factories are 100% government-owned, they often fall under excessive political interference and oversight. And so it is best for private equity okay. to get into the factory. So when people have what they call a skin in the game, somebody has mm -hmm. put in his own 10 million, his own 15 million, his own 20 million, that person or that group of people will be more interested in making sure the factory is efficient. But mm -hmm. they don't employ the wrong people. They don't just send their sisters and their cousins and their uncles to go and work in the factory I get you. because they are a minister or they are an MP or whatever they happen to be. Mm -hmm. So that certainly was a central factor in the so-called what went wrong. There was a whole series of lectures yeah. in the 1960s when I was in secondary school. And we're listening to them about what went wrong during the uh, Nkrumah era, the so-called square pegs in round holes. Mm -hmm. People who are not qualified for position square pegs we put in round holes to manage them. So I learned those lessons from those, even from that era. But as to the technical reasons why a factory can fail, it can be market challenges, it could be raw material problems, it could be technological Very problems. Well. And, 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 often, and often, often when any company fails, and you do a forensic analysis of it, you find that it is multivariate. Mm -hmm. Numerous factors led to the company failing. It's very rarely just one factor. It okay. will be a, a multiple of these factors, some of which I've just identified for you. So give us the history to this. Right. The Commander Sugar Factory itself, when the decision was taken to revamp it, why didn't we just go around and say, who are the investors who are willing to just put in their money? It's their project. We, country Ghana, we, are, we will help you create an environment for you to make sure that you build your factory, you run on your own. We don't run it because it doesn't belong to us. Why didn't you do that? Again, you asked me a question when I was not part of government, so I can't tell you why Mr. A or Madam B didn't do something. I'm saying that I'm giving credit to those who initiated the idea because mm -hmm. Ghana continues, and I'm saying that if it's as easy for every private sector person yeah. to invest in, they should be investing in it right now. Forget about what should have been done five years ago. Right now, 20 Ghanaians can get together and establish in the sugar factory they want. I get your point. But other things that became obvious, mm -hmm. when I organized three sugar related forums one in accra one in elmina and one in tamale to get the views of stakeholders 
and when we invited the foreign investors also to come, is that they wanted a sugar policy for Ghana, a policy that would govern okay. the sugar sector, that mm -hmm. would give them assurance that government is going to give them necessary support, okay. incentives, protections, etc. Two, that this becomes a law. So there's even the legislative draft that I left at the Ministry of Trade and Industry for a sugar act that would have provided the framework for anyone who wanted to invest in the sugar industry. Recently, we've had a debate about one district, one factory That's true. projects getting certain tax incentives, for example. Mm -hmm. So, and of course, one district, one factory initiative involves numerous sectors, not just sugar cane. But these investors also wanted similar assurances and similar support. And so if the one district, one factory gives those kinds of assistance, then I, I presume that some of the sugar investors that haven't come yet, they will also like to see a sugar policy specifically for the sugar sector, which will let them know that Ghana does not intend to import $300 million worth of sugar. Because if you're going to establish a factory for 20 million, 50 million, 80 million, and Ghana continues to import 300 million, million or 400 million dollars worth of sugar, then what will happen to your factory? People need to know that government does not intend to be wasting its taxpayers' money on sugar importation. And there are many simple decisions that governments can take. Yeah, I get that. of CPP, NDC, NPP. And that's another subject matter for another day. I, I, I get you. Such as all state enterprises, yeah. all public institutions, military, army, uh, police, hospitals, educational institutions should only buy made in Ghana products. I get your point. Sugar. This is something that we can kind of explore. statement alone makes a huge difference. This is numerous we can viabilities explore. of many factories. Yes, sir. I wanted to know from you when you took over that particular office right. as Trees and Industries Minister, whether there was any form of justification why Ghana was interested in spearheading the project itself and not saying let some other person come and take over. Was there any? <laughs> no, but I'm saying that you are begging the question in the sense that if People want to invest in the sugar sector. They can do it now. You could do it 10 years ago. They could do it 20 years ago. So they were not but interested. what I understood is that the Indian government, which also wanted to promote its exports. Now, when you hear of any government giving you uh, export-import funding, mm -hmm. it's almost invariably about them, that country, trying to promote their own exports. That's true. So almost all countries who, who give you import-export loans are for you to import products from their country. So the $35 million Indian Export Import Bank loaned to Ghana for this commercial sugar factory, from the Indian government's perspective, was to promote their Indian sugar processing equipment. You are not going to use Indian government money to buy Chinese government equipment or to buy Italian sugar processing equipment, right? So you. that was their interest in making such a loan available to Ghana. Ghana, of course, also wanted that loan. And of course, you can have all this value for money discussions as to whether the factory was worth 35, 30, or whatever million. But the Indian government, before my time, had already agreed through the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, through the Ministry of Finance, and through a parliamentary approval for the loan to give the people and government of Ghana $35 million to help us to establish a sugarcane factory. But as I'm saying, export import bank loans are loans given by countries to promote their own exports. Yeah. So in this case, they, they the Indian government, will select an Indian contractor for the project. To build it? To build it. Okay. So an Indian contractor came here. The same Indian government will then allow that Indian contractor to select only Indian equipment, not British or American sugarcane processing equipment, okay. which also was done. And then they also select an Indian consultant. Remember that Ghana hasn't had a sugarcane processing plant for, a very long for time. 40, 30 something years. So yeah. we don't have expertise in Ghana in sugar. In, the, in, in India, there are 600 sugarcane processing plants, 600. And they have degrees in BSE, sugar production, BSE, sugar factory management, BSE, and sugar. An entire industry being yeah, fed by Master, academia Master MSc, yes. sugar human it, it, resource it's, it's management. To know that. Now, so they okay. have experts in that area. And so the Indian government did their own internal um, competitive bidding and selected a company to be one, the factory. Um, the build of the factory yeah. and also the equipment suppliers and also the consultants to the factory. Who determined and the, the amount money of this actually? Case? Who determined the amount? Well, it would have been negotiated between the government of Ghana again before my time. Involved the Ministry of Finance is the only institution yeah. that borrows on behalf of the Ghana government. Was it so, at the time determined to be enough for this particular project? Absolutely, otherwise the factory could not have been built. So as to it, it was certainly enough to build this particular size 
of a factory. And the size of a factory is its daily tonnage crashing capacity. So like if you have a car, you have a 1.6 cc engine, 1.8, 2.0, 2.5, etc. Dif the same car, Mercedes-Benz, different, different models, or Toyota, different, different models. The same way you can have a small factory, a medium-sized factory, a big factory, an extra si large I, I factory. I get you, but so this for, factory, for, the car, for factory its size, together. was valued at that time as worth getting a $35 million loan to be able to buy the equipment, to procure the technical expertise, and to deliver the services and, and before that, my time. And that, that was contrary to the uh, IMF and their IDA's report that suggested that it required at least some 90 million US dollars to do I've this. I've never heard this before. You've not I've seen never the heard of this before. This, today, the here is the fact. And it doesn't make sense to me, with all due respect, because yeah. as I said, it depends on the throughput of a factory. As I said, you have 10 different models of cars with 10 different sizes of engines, and they all work on the road. One is smaller, one is medium, one is big, one is extra large. There are trucks, there are buses, and they all. But we've not move. seen the report. You no, cannot determine that's, whether that's that was from not a for. pure common sense yes. point of view. But I cannot determine whether that was you not the same project. You forgive me for speaking as a former executive of the International Finance Corporation yes. of the World Bank Group, which had the responsibility for making all kinds of investments all over the world. Yeah. So if this kind of issue came to a board meeting at the IFC, people would just trust it that the factory must only be 90 million and above. That's no, not it's not necessarily. I'm saying that that was some kind of estimation they put to it. I'm saying that there cannot be any statement that, that any sugarcane factory in Ghana must be at least 90 million. Unless somebody was arguing about what volume of sugar production will allow Ghana to be, let's say, sugar self-sufficient. Then you say, okay, to be, for Ghana to produce $300 million worth of sugar every year, it must have a factory that is worth at least 90 million or something like that. But even with the quantity of sugar that could be produced by the Commander Sugar factory, mm -hmm. Ghana will still need 10 more factories of a similar size to, to become to sugar self-sufficient. I, I, so I don't point. know where the 90 I mean, million comes yeah. from, but now, I'm just me, not heard about it. Yes, let me make this point to you too. Now, the minister suggests that the project we are looking at in this case was to some extent overvalued and that the 36 million even if you did not consider the extent of deterioration, 35. Mm -hmm. the, the 35 million right. was not in any way supposed to be the actual amount. Well, he mean, says he that all the <laughs> professionals from PwC but to I was a minister, technical, technical team within he, the ministry. He can speak for his, his period in office. Yes. He can't speak for my period in office. Alan is a good friend of mine. But the fact is that when I was a minister, and with all due respect <laughs> to everyone listening, I will not sit down and try and sell a factory for which a government has made $35 million available to our government and sell it for $12 million. How would I justify that? Now, if all the $35 million did not come and or we decide to cut short or you know, shortcut or circumvent something, then maybe the factory could be worth 12 or 15 or $18 million. But you know, deterioration. Do you know what happens to your own car, whatever car you drive, yeah. which may be worth $30,000 or 50,000 CDs, leave it by on any roadside for two years and try to sell it at the price that was originally the case and see whether you can sell it at the same price. Again, he puts in so that the case that, says that even, no. even if the deterioration Again, was not I don't, I don't know what valuation method they used. If you ask any accountant, they can give you five to seven different valuation methods. From a discounted cash Again, flow says approach. That virtually from all of uh, the groups, <laughs> from the, those in the ministry, from those at PwC, all of them this, come to a conclusion carefully. that... The same, ask them, what did PwC value this, com this project at? When we ask them to sell shares in the company to interested investors, you need to know that question. PwC is still alive. That's yes. the simple question to ask them. And you ask them that question. How much did you value this company when Spielgabra and others were in the Ministry of Trade and Industry, and when they asked the UPWC to look for an investor who would buy 70% of the shares for approximately $25 million. Which year now, was you this? cannot. When I was a minister, 20, 2016. Specific. Okay, 2016. That's before the factory, when we knew the factory was going to, to be completed, yeah. and as I've told you, because I, I didn't believe, and the NDC government did not believe, and I hope most Ghanaians don't believe, that it's best for civil servants and ministers and politicians to manage commercial factories. It was obvious that you're going to look for private managers and preferably private investors. Because if you bring a manager who is private, mm -hmm. and of course the managers actually were private, but who has no skin in the game 
as we say in the investment banking world, you haven't put your own money on the table. You are managing somebody's enterprise. You may manage it well, but most likely you may not manage it that if well. If it feels doesn't affect you. Because it doesn't affect you. But when you put your own money on the table, and you're also managing that factory, then you are more likely to manage it efficiently. This is a proven fact in the world of business and industry and every private business. So he's claimed that, that two months into the setting up of this company. Even before, so the, before the factory was completed, I had determined as minister, based on what I've just told you, yeah. which I hope with all due respect is as commonsensical as anybody would imagine, mm -hmm. and subsequently with the support of cabinet to find private investors for it. Okay. And there were other, you know we've had a privatization um, process in Ghana since the 1970s. Very, very long Mostly time. privatizing factories that Kwame Nkrumah built. That's true. If it was easy to build, let's say, a, a glass factory, that should be, a bottle glass factory should be working, or any other glass factory should be working in Ghana. But unless somebody has established a glass factory, ordinary glass, yeah, windscreen glass, window glass factory in Ghana, would you be surprised to know that Ghana doesn't produce any glass? We don't produce one square meter of glass. People bring sheet glass, chop them up in different shapes, and, and you know, supply your windows and your whatever else with it. So glass, for example, is something we need in Ghana. And we've, we have the raw materials to produce glass. But often you need state support in different forms, whether it's the supply of energy. In the case of glass, it needs a lot of energy. So a bottle glass factory, for example, will only be viable when gas from the western region climbs all the way to where a bottle is, or some other location in Ghana where silica and other raw materials are for that to be, to be viable. Did the factory we, ever we have, We've had the tire factory. We produce rubber in Ghana, right? I, I get your the point. The rubber is produced is forget it, I want to concentrate on the sugar factory. It's exported. It's yeah. not, we don't convert I, it to I tires. I want to concentrate on the sugar factory. Thank you very much. I'm asking yes. whether it ever produced sugar. Too much. It produced sugar. It was sitting on my market? desk. <laughs> in the, for this very, very Ghanaian market. Really? The test run. I mean, when you see, when okay. you produce... Test run. When you produce, a, when you build a factory, even when you, when you buy your car, you must test run it. You don't run it at... 150 miles an hour. You run it at a moderate um, speed on the Accra Tamamoto way to make sure that your own brand new car is in good shape. All factories go through test runs. So the first two to three months of the factory's existence was mostly testing the factory, testing the machinery, but we also tested it practically. We're not just testing it in a vacuum. Uh, what you're showing is sugar cane being crushed in the factory. Mm -hmm. So there were hundreds and hundreds of sugar cane producers, private Ghanaian sugar cane producers, who the factory managers identified in a 50-mile catchment area of the factory, mostly in central region. But eventually, it became clear that we would need even more, more um, sugar cane than what was immediately available in the 20 to 50-mile radius. So we made numerous announcements in the public media that Comela Sugar Factory is willing and able to take sugar cane that would come from a hundred mile diameter or radius of the factory in a, in a distance that is 100 meters from the factory which will hit the lower part of Ashanti region, hit parts of eastern region, hit parts of western region and of course almost all of Greater Accra could, and some parts of the Volta region, lower, lower parts, could feed the factory as long as the sugar cane got to the factory within six hours. Did, of it's being cut. Okay. Now, so did we, we crashed the factory. Okay. You, you yeah. Yeah. We sugar yes, we're you saw showing the, you saw the of that. No, and no, molasses no. was produced. In fact, the way we convinced the, the sugarcane um, planters, the sugarcane producers, is that they mostly sell their sugarcane to Akwetesi distillers. Okay. And we told them that to distill the Akwetesi, you have to move to a stage of molasses. And then you move to another stage where the, the liquor comes out. Hmm. But the, this plant produces a lot of molasses. But there's a huge, you know, thousands of tonnage vat that molasses enters. And we said this factory can produce the molasses for you much, much more efficiently and okay. at a cheaper cost than you yourself can produce it. So why don't you wait? Let the factory produce the molasses for you. Buy yeah, the molasses and do your apprenticeship. So they're very happy with it. Okay. And they lined up truckload after truckload after truckload to feed the factory with it. And sugar cane came out of it. I mean, sugar came out of it. You said that it became obvious we knew that we didn't have enough sugar for it. Not in the immediate catchment area. Not in the immediate That's catchment I, area. That was, and, and therefore, we announced that you could bring sugar from as far as 100 miles of the factory, which would allow you to drive the sugar cane to the factory, hopefully within six hours, so that the sugar content in the sugar cane would still be good enough to be processed and for sugar to be produced. Was this not known prior to setting up the factory? It was known that we didn't have sugarcane factory, so sugarcane um, pla plantations 
owned by the state. That was well known. But what, again, there's an error that is made. Provisions mm -hmm. for it. Well, the same Indians had agreed that they would make $25 million again available for the agronomy part, which is the growing of the sugar um, plantation. Yeah. Arguments have been made. That did not happen. Well, not during my time. It certainly didn't happen while I was in office. The negotiations were going on. The Indians had a change in government, and Prime Minister Modi came in, mm -hmm. and they also went about changing their whole import export regime. Just as we do here, you suck your balls, you suck this, you suck that. It delayed a whole lot of things. So the 25 million for the agronomy didn't come up. So, but, but the 25 error, million was supposed to be after the plant was put in place. It could have come before, it could have come during, it could I have come after. I want to know what the agreement was. No, the, it would have obviously come after, because the 35 for the factory itself had already come. And the factory was being built by Indians. So the Indian government, which knows more about sugarcane production than you and I, acknowledged that even if they sent the $35 million first for the factory to be produced, it would actually make the growing of the sugarcane more viable. Why? Because when you are growing anything, I'm a farmer. So I know about cashews, about mangoes, about pineapples, a whole lot of other things. And when you are, the, the most important thing for any farmer is the market. Why shall I sell my tomatoes or even my chicken when I've grown them, after I've been through all my costs? So in all of industrial management theory, mm -hmm. having a factory gives assurance to you who wants to go into sugarcane farming that when I farm my sugarcane, 5 acres, 10 acres, 20 acres, there's a factory waiting to buy my sugarcane. It's one of the best ways of incentivizing the agronomy part. Otherwise, if you say go to do agronomy first and the factory comes later, you can get sugarcane produced and people will just be chewing sugarcane all over Ghana because I, there's no I, factory. I'd like to bring this to your to, attention because part of the factory being set up, Imani in his um, advice to the ministry stated categorically that it will take not less than 1,000 hectares of land to produce enough sugarcane to even begin this and make it viable. In fact, using standard yields, um, it suggests that there's a requirement of more than 7,000 hectares to meet the plan throughput of the factory. This is significantly higher than the proven arable land available within the project catchment area. Yeah, because as again, what is project catchment area? In the past, Komenda Sugar Factory had its own farms. And you know, at the Kwame Nkrumah, we had state farms. Yes, that's true. And, and so the Komenda Sugar Factory had its own farms of, depending on who you are talking to and what time of the year, which year you are talking about, with three, four, five thousand hectares or acres of farm land that Komenda Sugar Factory had. But after the factory collapsed in the Nkrumah era, people obviously encroached on the land. Mm -hmm. You know how our country is. Every yeah. piece of land, somebody wants to take it for whatever reason. So by the time this factory came, the original land size available for a state-owned farm was much less than it used to be. But, so if the point uh, Imani is making is that there's not enough land for the state itself to own its own agronomy, they may be right. But that's why the... The structure of the, the project was based on independent private farmers supplying the factory. I'm sure you've heard about when people talk about outgrower schemes. So you have a factory and then you have outgrowers, tomato fa farmers who are, whose farms are their own personal farms. They're not owned by the factory to okay. supply to the factory. Or you have a cat cattle ranchers who supply their cattle to a meat processing plant. So Accra Abattoir does not have to have its own cattle ranching around if they don't want to. If they want to have it also, that's fine. You see, for people who make mistakes about the fact that every factory must have its own uh, agricultural production base near it, let's ask this question. Why is it that cocoa, uh, which is one of our largest export revenues uh, and, and export, the Europeans who process cocoa, they don't have any cocoa trees there. There's no cocoa tree near any Swiss or Belgian chocolate or cocoa processing because plant. they are buying seeds, yet, they are not buying the they are buying seeds. Well, from, fine, yes. but I'm just saying that. So <laughs> uh, you don't have to have a factory right next to the source of the, the raw material for it to work, depending on the nature of the crop. So, but as long as you can get the crop to the factory, and I said you transport them, it created job for drivers, it created job for vehicle owners. We had over 100 truck owners lined up and signed up by Commercial Sugar Factory who are on contract to deliver sugar to the factory. We had over a thousand people who were cutting the sugar cane okay. as workers and another 500, five per truck loading the sugar cane that has been cut into these trucks all over the 50 mile radius so, to supply sugar cane to the factory. So we're cutting uh, lots uh, of jobs. June 24, 2016, the then PR of the ministry, Akresi Sapon, confirmed to us that the factory had been shut down. 
What was the reason for that shutdown? I, June 24, 2016. I, 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 can't see, I can't see why he would have made that statement. And these dates, I mean, I don't have the dates here, so the fact it could not have been shut down on that within one month of its commissioning, no. But it certainly went into a period of rehabilitation and maintenance. As I said, when you open a, when you start After a factory... After a month of its commissioning? Well, I can't, that's what I'm saying. I can't give you the exact date. Somebody gave you that date. And he's the peer of your ministry. He, in he fact, can he be took, right and he can he be wrong. He took liberty to go and confirm the time and came back to uh, us I'm with not specific disputing information. the time, but I'm not confirming it because I don't have the same information that you have. You are not but privy I'm, to this shutdown? Not to the date. You have mentioned a particular date. And I'm saying that, yes, the factory shut down after a certain period based on two things. One, the trial period would have been over. And so maintenance and repair and adjustments might be, re might be needed. And number two, sugarcane processing, just as many other, the production of other agro crops is seasonal. You see, um, there are many crops that don't grow all year round. I'm a cashew farmer, for example, 20 years of cashew farming. You may know that in cashew, the cashew plant is harvested usually between January I and, get you, and, that, that particular May. period. So when the period is over and the Ghana sugarcane crop it's estimated, the, the bulk of it is estimated from October to around April, May. So after May, June, you probably are not going to get enough sugarcane to make that particular factory to work. After the June shutdown, was right. it ever reopened and sugar produced? I would have to check my records. I don't think so, but I would rather prefer to check my records. Why did that happen? Well, there are a number of factors. First of all, the company which... <laughs> build a factory was not the company to run the factory, right? Yeah. Number two, you needed to establish a legal entity, a Commander Sugar Factory Company Limited, yeah. which unfortunately would then be 100% owned by the state, and which was the one that we were trying to sell and offload some shares to private sector investors. So one, you had a management team in place, but they're not that very experienced. We asked the Indians to hang around and help us if they could, yeah. but they were also willing to charge some fees for which there was no budget. Okay. Um, to get them to help with both the agronomy part, for which they had already planted a certain number of acres, using a number of cultivars, that are the seedlings. They were testing different kinds of sugarcane so crops we, we to see it, which would be the best. Management and people take over. Well, and there's the a managing director and several yeah, I get you, senior but management I mean, I'm talking team. about the people who are supposed to take over. Because no, we no, couldn't no. get yes. any, that's right. why we that's didn't start again. The reason. What we, was the other reason? I've just told you there was not enough sugarcane during that period to produce sugarcane in Ghana. Sugarcane doesn't produce, doesn't grow 12 years in the 12 months in a year. The mangoes don't grow 12 months in a year. Which would have suggested that in October that same year, the factory should have been reopened. Year. 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 So in October, it could have opened subject it was not to opened. the factors I'm telling you. I remember that we went there with our correspondence. Okay. And it was not opened. Fantastic. And I'm telling you that This subject, was after the people complained that they are still waiting for their work, but they are still out there and they cannot get in the farm. In, in the no, factory. Which, who, are, who are those complaining? The people living in, in the areas around the Commander Sugar Factory. You those wanted to supply sugar cane yes. to them? They said yeah, that but they, if there's sorry, no money to buy the sugar cane, they, you can't run it. That's, that's the problem. To run the sugar cane factory, yeah. you need a, the government would have to fund it. Yeah. The and government, government don't have Ghana. money for it. Well, as I said, it was not the plan of the government to run a factory owned by the state and managed by civil servants and politicians like myself. So why didn't we get somebody to buy or and buy said, shares? By the it? time I was leaving, there were four companies that had made offers to buy. And Price of the House And this was getting to the end free. of 2016, right? Yeah. Price of the House should feel free. But that's one of the points the minister made. He made yeah. it sound as if it was a negative thing that just two months after the factory had been opened, the government was already willing to sell shares in the factory. Not sell off the whole factory, but sell shares in the factory to allow for private management. Again, the minister that want us to have a government-run factory, the way Ghana was, was run by certain government, and okay. they, they killed it. You're of the opinion so. that the 75% was going for how much? What was the agreed amount? 70% 70. was to be sold for $25 million. 70%. Million. Not a whole factory being apparently now valued at $12 million. Only 70%. And if Pastor House thought that didn't make sense, they would never have written a letter to anybody saying, please come and buy this factory. They did the evaluation. They yeah. did the evaluation and they, they did the, the advertisements. And they invited the potential um, bidders. They did the, the bid assessment with uh, some a committee and made a recommendation for about a preferred bidder so, exactly, before I left office. So, so exactly and we handed over all that to uh, the next government. 
how, all they had to do was to follow how, it. How long when did we, the, forgive me, the, I'll come back to that point. <laughs> but how long did we need to get this investor on board? Because if they pay the money, shut down no, in the, June. No, if they pay the money, are they, there are deadlines given to them. Yeah. Pay your 70%. Within which period? Within certain periods. Put uh, NS money down. You know, there's a Forgive whole process. Forgive me, what was the specific period I given can't give them? You, I can't give you those periods. But I'm saying this those, negotiation, those, those, uh, this negotiation, these were tight timelines. I get your point, but this, tight timelines. this negotiation with yes. these investors, right. when did they start? The request for price, again, you want, you're asking me for information that I'd have had to come with a whole notebook like what no, no, I want clarity on this matter because this, stations, this <laughs> right? I asked me for dates <laughs> so when did the negotiation because start I want, to, I want to give you a date I want to fill it was April 15th it was June 25th okay, so give, to give me the you month not even the date in 2016 yeah the government of Ghana decided to look for investors for the factory even before the factory was commissioned because we knew the factory would be commissioned oh somebody must manage that's it. great so we didn't get any throughout the entire year it, it looks like you're not also <laughs> remembering things I've said four Companies bid. The price of the house was selected during the process. It takes time to yes, select a, yes. a transaction advisor. Transaction advisor prepares certain documents. It advertises it in, through various channels internationally. That like Ghana is seeking an investor for its sugarcane processing plant. Gives all the parameters of the sugarcane processing plant. Companies look at the, the advertisement. I get your point. That process is known to many. So that whole process was going on between May, June, July, August, September. By the time he left, by the time we are talking about September. Uh, the four companies that were interested have been identified, and one of them had been selected. By September? September, October, I would say, of 2016. Yeah. And one had been selected as a preferred bidder. And that preferred bidder had been given term sheets that if you are interested, do this by this date, do this by this date, do this by this date. So if they had deposited their money by whatever the dates were, then would have been given the chance to manage the factory. By the time and he left it office, be a headache for the government anymore. By the time he left office, all that was left was the deposit of this money, right? To the best of my knowledge. That was all that was left. To the best of my knowledge. Now, the claim that, of course... And the, the company at that time could not have been negotiating to pay money if they thought the factory was not worth 35 million or they should not be offering 70, you know, offering 25 million for 70% of that factory. We wouldn't have gotten anywhere near there if there was nobody who was in, one, interested in sugarcane processing plant in Ghana, two, who disputed the value of the company, then they would have negotiated about valuation. That, okay, we can do 70%, but we'd like to buy the 70% for, say, 20 million. That never came to my desk. That people are interested in this factory, but they don't have to pay 25 million. They'd rather pay 17, 15. It never came to my desk. And anybody who has any such correspondence should produce it for the whole world to see. Now, the minister says that your very good self has questions to answer. I haven't heard that. Alan Chamatin, my good friend, will never make such a statement. He really? Never, no, no. Uh, give me a give but, me his sorry, sorry. I'm saying that <laughs> you, you were the minister at the time. Yeah, he will You're not ultimately responsible that, for the ministry. You know, I was responsible for the ministry, but yes. Alex Martin will not go and stand anywhere and say that Spio Gabriel has a case to answer. He won't say that. No, I mean, of course, I mean, he's not going to say. He said that people were in charge at the time, and you were in charge at the time. Well, you can make me in charge at the time if you want. No, because but you were not the <laughs> minister at the ministry. I was, the, I was the minister of the ministry, but I've just given you the history of it. I get your point, but I'm saying that... Are you going to put parliament... As a, it was a parliamentary Forgive decision. The, the parliament that decided to approve a $35 million loan to Ghana. I didn't approve that loan. I, I'm not so disputing that. So you want to bring the, parliament to answer the, why the, did they approve? The, no, listen the, the to me. The main question why is this case. No, you're trying, yes. to, you're trying to infer statements that the minister has not made, and I'm trying to debunk your statement. You see, this is not an NDC versus MPP thing, which is what happens almost all the time. If you really want to go to the bottom of it, you can make it a Ghana government versus an Indian government debate. Because if anybody says that the factory is not worth 30 million, then you have to go to where the 35 million dollars came from, where the consultant came from, where the contractor came from, and where the equipment came from to let them justify that factory being 35 million. Because Ghana is now in debt to the Indian government to approximately that tune. That's assuming. All 35 million came in. But that figure, that fact can also be confirmed only by the Ministry of Finance because my ministry didn't receive $35 million for us to disperse. So that's something else we want the public to know. I did not have $35 million in my office where I was sharing to people. Ministry of Finance, to the best of my knowledge, did not even receive that $35 million. That's not the way export import bank money works. The money is kept in India and they pay the Indian contractor based on certificates of completion, which their own consultants. And our own officials also approve. So we are. So I don't no, think the money ever came to Ghana as money that Ghanaians can share. So do you have a way of determining whether indeed and in fact the 35 million was the amount of money that was spent on this project? That, that is what the accountant general and auditor general and other people. That's their responsibility. 
Your it's ministry did at any point no, in time? Was not, our ministry didn't get into that. Not at all? Not to the best of my knowledge. Now, it's, it was not a matter between an Indian contractor and the Ministry of Trade Industry. It is Ghana government and the government of India. Ghana government has a Ministry of Foreign Affairs which deals with the bilateral and multilateral relations between Ghana, India, and other countries. Ghana government has a Ministry of Finance which is solely responsible for all loan agreements between any entity and the government of Ghana. My ministry doesn't take loans on its own and didn't take a loan in this regard. I have to. So if you want to know about 35 million, whether it came to Ghana, yeah. Ministry of Finance will be the ones to tell you that maybe 29.9 came, but 30 didn't come because of fees and charges, etc. Only 31 million came. Ministry of Finance will be the best place to give you that figure. So, to be fair, that means that you are not in the position to dispute whether or not that factory at the time rarely even cost 12 or 20 or 25. If the factory cost only 10 million, yes. but I could get investors who are willing to pay 25 million for 70 percent, then I was doing very well. You know why? Because valuations, you can have market valuation. Yeah. You can have discounted cash flow valuation. You mm -hmm. can have comparable valuation. There are about seven different ways of valuing an enterprise. I, I get your and point. the fact that the government of Ghana wanted to put in place a sugar act, a sugar policy, give incentives to sugar farmers, can he easily raise the value of a company. When you hear that Microsoft is a one trillion dollar company, it doesn't mean that you are going to count how many uh, chips or how many yeah. laptops they have. It is a market valuation based on how people see that company's future, even the future of the company. Its prospects for production, the, for export, my, and all make the company. My question We're not is selling that equipment or factory. We're I, selling I get your company, point, but I'm not disputing company. that. My question is that yes. you really are not in the position to state authoritatively that the factory cost 35 million, according to That's what you told me. The word cost, the way you're using the word cost, I've told you about valuation. Doc, And the minister talked about valuation. Forgive me. If you want to do cost, what kind of cost? Sorry, Is sorry. it replacement sorry, cost valuation? There are different kinds of valuations. My question is simple. No, it's a wrong question. You, have, you have just it. told me yes. that you did not receive a PESWA directly as Minister of Trade and Industry, which doesn't happen anyway. Yeah, and you way, did not verify a single receipt no, you, that, that, you haven't got into receipts. No, you see. You sorry, sorry forgive me. Okay, no, no. The, the I don't Indian want to because that's what I'm The Indian contractors yes. will submit reports of the progress they are making. Mm -hmm. An Indian consultant will also review it, and Ministry of Trade and Industry officials will also review it. We have auditors, we have financial people in our ministry who review the statements to make sure that they are correct. Then instructions will be sent to the Indian government saying the company has met these requirements. You can pay them. Whatever they have. So, as of the time place. the project ended, mm -hmm. what was the final valuation they put to it? The final valuation is the what I'm saying was best determined by Price Waterhouse PWC, is their new name. They're no longer Price Waterhouse. PWC. Very credible. How, how, international. Much, how much did they say it was? The company was being sold publicly. I mean, I wish I could get the daily yes, graphic please, or whatever. How much did they say it was? $25 million for 70%. So if you calculate the 100 percentile of that, it's as close to 35 as you can get. Interesting. Now, I want to see. $25 million mm -hmm. was being given to any investor to enable them to acquire 70% shares in the company. The government was going to continue to be a shareholder. So we'll keep an eye on it mm -hmm. and have somebody on the board monitoring things. There'll be Ghanaian management team, Indians or somebody else, Mauritius, whoever came in as an investor, will also bring in their chief finance officer or their MD or whatever. But I wanted Ghanaians to be the majority employees in the company and to, for jobs to be created for Ghanaians. And for Ghana's importation of sugar to go down. So we are spending a whole lot of time on the micromanagement of who should have done what or the other. Our view is that once your father leaves you a car, even if you think that was not the best car your father should have left you, drive it. And if you think that your father left you the car and there's a problem with the engine, etc., you can investigate, you can get mechanics to investigate it. But keep driving the car, use it. Right you, now, if the car was being used, the factory was being operated, people in the sugar, commander. I get you, you made this call, but because I'm jobs, wrapping up, uh, because I'm wrapping up. Sugar production, sugar importation would have gone down. CD would have become somewhat strengthened, and the economy would be stronger. So that's what we should be looking at. Because I'm but wrapping up, I'm just criminalize people by saying, Sorry. whose fault was it? Who should have done this and that? Yeah. You can do that all day no, long. No, no, I'm, I'm wrapping up on this conversation. Economic problems, yes, sir. The government says it's looking for somebody else to buy after two years you see when the people that wanted to buy when i met them informally yeah. somebody said i said oh, the new government wants to find their own people to buy it that's what the people that's told what you. they do they don't want to deal with that so the fact has been live it was an ndc government that found you you so as if those people are they're not ndc people I, mean, I don't deal with people because they want to buy a government asset and they must belong to a particular party no because the money they are bringing 
the dollars doesn't have NDC and BP or CBP written on it. It's money for the people of Ghana. They told you that because um, this factory is lying idle because lying idle. They, they have rejected them as NDC contract, uh, what they call it, bias. That's how they described the situation, why they couldn't move forward with their transactions. And they are, this is happening in many other sectors of the economy. How do you feel when you see the status of Commander today? I feel sad because it is the human aspect we are losing. The fact that it is somebody's children's school fees that he can't pay, it is somebody's mother's medical bill he can't pay, it's somebody who ought to be employed who is not employed. It is a number of graduates who would have ended up also going to study master's degrees in sugar production and sugar marketing that never got to do that. So when you begin to look at the human element and you look for the thousand of sugarcane farmers who can't sell their crops anymore or who are now okay. diverting it all to and therefore causing alcoholism all over the place, then it is that human factor, the human cost, mm -hmm. and the cost to our economy, the cost to the city, the cost to our trade balance. Doc, that I think is and, the, I need to the go most unfortunate me. part well, of Folks, it. that's where we end today's edition of Affront. My name is Raymond Dalqua.